Um, I think it's really important that you start out early with the homework. Like it's, it's really hard if you, like the deadline is Friday at midnight, if you start Friday morning, you don't have like, an, like a chance to fail at something, right? Or some are getting stuck and asking somebody. So if you just get stuck early, you have an opportunity to use office hours to ask for Slack, um, and, and you have a much better shot at completing it successfully. Um, the, they are always due on Fridays at midnight, but we have a late day policy. Um, the late day policy means that um, if you submit your homework on Saturday, we'll deduct 10 points. If you submit your homework on, tw uh, on Sunday, uh, we'll deduct 20 points. You have to submit it by Sunday night because Monday we start the grading. Um, so that's kind of like a hard deadline. Um, like there is a grace period of like an, a time that I don't want to specify. Um, but essentially, if you submit your homework three minutes after midnight, you will not be deducted um, uh, uh, like a late penalty. But there is a, there is a line right somewhere uh, in there. Um, so this is meant for also giving you some flexibility, right? If you have like a busy week with exams. Um, then you can use something like that. Um, of course, if you have some like extenuating circumstances, like you have you've been hospitalized or you've been really sick, um, then you can ask for an extension and then talk to us. We can give this within reason, but we also do want to release homeworks uh, solutions so that you can kind of check whether you've what, like why you maybe didn't get all the points or what you could have done differently. Um, so there is a limit to how much uh, we can extend it. Um, as I already mentioned, the final project is kind of like the culmination, like that brings everything together that we learned in this course. The final project is a really important uh, component of the course. Um, it's going to be team-based, ideally two to three people. Um, and it has three components, um, like three major components. You have to put in the proposal, and then there's two milestones, like one where you submit um, like a draft of your visualization, um, and then a, a final version. And you'll get feedback on the proposal and on the milestone. We'll, of course, give you also feedback on the final submission, but that won't be actionable for you anymore. And then there's two exams, 10% each. So as you recognize, they're not particularly high value in this class. Um, they are uh, on, always on the Thursday before fall break or the semester ends. Um, and those are slightly different for grad students as they are for um, undergraduates. Any questions about the grading? Yes. Um, is there a lecture where you will have covered everything we need for the homework? Yeah, so I try to, um, that, that is an important point. I try to get everything done on the Thursday before the like, eight days ahead of lecture. This won't hold actually for the first one or two homeworks just because it takes me a little longer to catch up to the material, but those are also fairly short. Um, so I will only be able to introduce the stuff that you need for your homework one on Tuesday, um, but that's the exception. Like the later homeworks, we will have covered that. Um, and so there might be at the beginning there might be some of these conflicts, um, and but but I think they sh should be okay in terms of how hard the homeworks are. But if if this is a problem, uh, come talk to me. Okay. Uh, I already mentioned this uh, code of conduct um, that we are really committed to provide an exclusive and harassing free environment regardless of gender, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, race, or religion. So I really would like to take uh, everyone this to heart and we do not tolerate harassment and here are some resources. Um, you can find more information at the syllabus um, about all of this. Um, this is really important to all of us um, and so just really make sure that I uh, speak up uh, either to me or to some like safe neutral uh, distance if you see anything or if you feel you're being mistreated in any way. Um, I also mentioned this last time, cheating. This is a very unpleasant thing. Um, there are automated ways to check code for similarity both to current um, colleagues and also to prior years solutions. Um, so please simply do not get uh, do it. Like, if you feel like, hey, I haven't had time, I really need to copy somebody's homework, it's much, much better to simply take a zero um, on that homework than to fail a whole class. Right? There is like, there, there is really like, yeah, don't, just don't do it. Um, this is a, a something that, that you might find a little strange, we, I, uh, and I, I don't strictly enforce it, but I, this is kind of like more of a recommendation than an enforcement. Um, it's really hard for me to be as entertaining as whatever Facebook video you might be looking at right now. Um, and so that's why I would like you to not use any uh, internet-enabled devices during class. Some of you might be taking notes. 
Um, there is research um, uh, to, that taking notes by hand is much better than taking notes by typing. You're probably a really great typist because you've like grown up with keyboards. Um, and so you can actually, you don't actually mentally have to abstract anything if you type it down, but if you make handwritten notes, um, you can actually, like, you, you kind of go through the process thinking about it and then abstracting it. Um, and so there's research that shows that. Um, and of course, we have the technical lectures where, where I actually encourage you to code along or to try some parameterizations of some algorithms and so on. Um, that then, of course, you, you can use your computers. Um, and if you have any reasons, um, um, like, uh, and, and a personal reason for using a device, I'm of course fine with that too. Um, okay, we, we can skip this. Um, next week we have homework one view, and then on um, Tuesday we'll be starting an introduction into Git, HTML, CSS, and SVG. So homework one will actually no be no JavaScript. It will just be um, uh, HTML, CSS, and SVG um, manually written. So it's going to be uh, a slightly like tedious, but um, useful to get to know SVG. And then we'll kick off our TA office hours. Um, like the way we release homeworks is through our GitHub repository. So if you go to this website, uh, github.com slash database course, um, then you'll find the 2019 database course, course homework repository. So, so many of you already have done homework zero. Um, and we only released um, homework one two days ago. Uh, and you can look at homework one here. Like there's usually um, in this case, it's just a plain readme, so you don't have any skeleton code, but we often provide you with some skeleton code. But here, what we'll, you'll do is to you will kind of visualize this data set with manual SVG and some CSS. So you'll create some bar charts, some line charts, some area charts, and a scatter plot um, with a regression line. Um, so all this is, is quite simple, right? So you basically just have to write the SVG on your own. There's a couple of, of things that you can do with transformations and so on that makes it a little bit less boring. Um, OK, but we'll talk more about how all of this works uh, in the Tuesday lecture. Um, then I kind of wanted to um, like advertise a little bit. Like If you were like, a new grad student, either in the PhD or a math program, um, we have like, this newish, like two, hour, two years old track now on human-centered computing. I'm quite involved in, in like creating and maintaining this track. and so. Human-centered computing is broadly any kind of like interactions between what humans do, how humans think, and computing. Um, and so that has like this course is a required course for them, but there's also advanced HCI and HCI courses, and then an introduction to stats and research design, which is important in HCI research. We need to kind of like understand how people use um, artifacts that we create, and so there's some uh, some of that. And then there's a lot of electives. There's a lot of computer science electives. So if you want to take NLP, that's an elective, for example. But it's a kind of unique in the computing program that it has a lot of pre-approved non-CS courses that are electives. So for example, typographic communication, digital fabrication, product design, introduction to research design, advanced human cognition, methods in social psychology, neuropsychology, ethnographic methods, and so on. So all of these courses are um, like across campus. And either psych or in design or in sociology, sociology or in EAE. And so if you have like an interest in that space, this might be the right track for you. And I did mention this course, so um, with that, I'll switch over to today's content. Any questions about anything formal while I switch? Did you post your lectures? Yes. Um, <laughs> I do post them sometimes a little late, um, but I think they, they appear on the schedule. So if you go to data this course um, and then go to schedule, you will have for every class here there will be a link where you can download the slides. Okay, so let's talk about perception. Uh, there's two terms that we'll talk about today: uh, perception and condition, and those are different in, in like as a kind of level of abstraction. So perception is the identification and the interpretation of sensory information, and is concerned with everything that starts from a physical stimulus to us recognizing information. Um, like our perception is, is not completely neutral. It's just it's not just signal processing, right? But there is also some uh, shaping by what we learn, by some memory, and by our own expectations. Cognition, uh, on the other hand, is like a higher level process. This is really about processing the information that we get through perceptual channels. 
and applies knowledge. So like a good, a, a good example to kind of understand the difference is to hear somebody speak is perception, to understand the language and the words is cognition. You still can hear somebody if they're speaking in a language you don't know, but you can't understand it. It's not, it's not a cognitive process. So here, like percent topics are roughly um, associated with perception are the eye, the optical nerve, the visual cortex, some basic perceptional properties, the first processing that we do, like what are edges, what are planes. And usually this is not conscious and or reflexes, like if somebody like um, tries to hit you, this is a, a perceptual property. Um, cognition is about recognizing an object. If I see something and I recognize this is a car, or if I can see relations between objects, those two cars are driving approximately at the same speed. Um, drawing conclusions, these cars might actually hit me if I don't move out of the street. Um, problem solving and learning um, are cognitive, cognitive um, concepts. And so this is kind of like a, um, like a distinction between uh, perception and cognition. You kind of like perceive this as blue, but if you read it, you, like, you, you run through the cognitive process of uh, interpreting language, um, and then you understand that the word here is brown. Um, so not everything, uh, like we, we don't objectively perceive our reality. Um, it's not about exactly what is in our environment. We do make like unconscious modifications to it. Um, so this here is a picture that uses an effect that's called perceptual hysteresis. Um, who can spot an interesting object here? A dog? A dog, yes. Who sees the dog? Rich hand. Okay, so here's the snout, and the, the ears, this is a leg, this is a leg. Right? So this is like, it's not easy to see the Dalmatian, um, but, it's, but we actually can, can actually perceive that dog. It would be pretty hard to write like a deep learning algorithm that recognizes this dog. It's like a, an interesting challenge. Um, so who can see something here? What do you guys see? An elephant, yes. Um, so here, this is the trunk, then here is the head, with the ears, the, the legs, the belly. So what's all the other stuff? Then? The other stuff are, are distractors, essentially, right? This is actually from a paper uh, that, um, that, that describes how you can generate these kinds of pictures. Like the previous example is a well-known example that somebody, a human, has designed. This paper introduced how you can generate these images. Um, and it's also interesting that this only works if we have the whole scene. So if we look only at patches, like this was a, like a study, if we, um, like this is the input scene that was used to generate those pictures. And if they only gave people these patches here, they couldn't actually recognize any of the elements, even though you can in the, in the concrete rendering. Right? So you kind of need the whole thing to really reason about it. Um, so, our perception is really based on priors. We have like a mental model of the world, and we try to fit what we see into this model, right? Um, so we, we kind of like try to reason of it based on the things that we've learned. How does it make sense in that context? Um, here is an example that kind of like our prior, like this looks like a 3D scene. Of course, that was carefully constructed. And in reality, if you just slightly move your uh, field of view, you will see it differently. Right? Um, so we rely on these priors. We, we expect um, a, a woman to have the, like a leg of a certain length and not of this, and so that kind of helps to trick us if we move into the right perspective here. Uh, <laughs> here are some other examples of, of like odd pictures that where we kind of like assume the continuation right of this body here, but then by, by like juxtaposing two different, uh, let's say uh, like a human and a dog, this is what happens. Um, so there's, there's plenty of those pictures where we're kind of like our model doesn't really fit with what you see and we get these funny pictures. The other thing is that we are evolutionary primed to recognize faces. Um, and so that's like the Jesus in toast uh, example, or the like terrified pickle, or uh, the, the funny uh, like power charger. Um, so we can we can quickly recognize faces, and that's something like a feature um, that we've simply evolved to do. Uh, well, and it's called pareidolia. So the take home point here for visualization is vision is constructed top down from the input. Uh, and what we see, uh, what you see when you see a thing depends on what the thing is, what you see the thing as, 
depends on what you know about what you're seeing. Um, so this is just like um, restate um, is the bit what I said earlier that we kind of like our vision depends on, on what we know about the world and we try to fit things within the world. And I'll have a lot of examples today that kind of like show that particular thing. Let's talk about, take a step back and talk about some of the biology and how whole, like, whole, like perception of, of light and color and sound works. Um, so you've probably had like a like junior high um, biology class or something like that where you've seen like diagrams of this, like the eye, we have the, the pupil, the lens, uh, then we have the, uh, the pupil, the body of the eye, and where really all of the, uh, the optical nerves are, are on the retina, which is kind of the inside of your eyeball. Um, and there, like the focused light from the lens is kind of projected onto the retina. And these are kind of like where the cells are that, that actually perceive it. And then we have the optical nerve. Uh, like here like, is the optical nerve. And that is kind of like where we have the blind spot. So you, we have like a certain spot somewhere here uh, where we don't actually have any. Um, any rods and cones that, um, that um, allow us to see. Um, and the opposite of that is kind of like the central point of vision here, the fovea. Um, and here we have like the best, highest resolution color vision. Um, so we have uh, two types of um, um, sensors. We have uh, cone, rods and cones. Um, and the cones are like we have five or six million cones roughly. Um, those are really responsible for the color vision. And they're dense in the center around the phobia. Uh, and we have so 27 times the density in and around the phobia compared to the rest of the retina. So this is really like where we have sharp central color, uh, color vision. Um, and uh, the, uh, we have about 120 million rods, which are spread out um, across the retina. And they are mostly responsible for our black and white vision. Um, and so if you like, plot a diagram uh, where you have like angle from the fovea here, then you can see the concentration, like the relative concentration uh, of, uh, of how, ma how many uh, rods, uh, rods and cones we have at a certain point. So you can see that there's kind of like this um, like sharp decline outside of the fovea um, as you move outside of the, um, of the retina. And you also see that at the blind spot, we have none of them. Uh, this is like a historical coloring. Uh, you can the, the, the names rods and cones come from uh, from the shape of these uh, of these uh, cells. Um, so the sensitive to black and white are the rods, and the cones here um, that are cone shaped are responsible for our color vision. And here is like an electron microscope um, uh, for, um, picture of uh, cones and rods, um, and this is here is a rough. Um, picture of the distribution of which kind of light sensitive cone we have. Um, and as you can see, we have like, more reds, then we have green, and we have diffused in blue. Um, and so this is again this picture that I showed you earlier. Like here, this was the phobia. This is for the cones. The rods are more evenly distributed um, across the uh, retina. And then we have in the phobia, the cones have, we have three different types of cones, the red, blue, and the green cones. And they are basically sensitive to a different wavelength. Um, but it's not that they are sensitive to exactly 575 nanometers, right? They get kind of stimulated um, by like, sh like slightly shorter, slightly longer length across like what uh, this, this kind of distribution. Um, and what you can see here is that we have like um, pretty good coverage in this area, but less coverage in this area. And so, like, if the panel like um, is also the reason why we tend to be a little bit worse um, at seeing blue colors and shades of blue than we do for green um, and for red. Um, and then there's other animals um, that have more types of cells. Um, so they have like three or four of them, um, and then you have like a more complete color vision. And some of, some animals can even see ultraviolet uh, or infrared light. Um, this here is kind of like an illustration of um, like if you if I took a static snapshot of what you're seeing, if I, if you're looking at a spreadsheet, this would be what it looks like. Um, so you say like this looks a little like this is obviously very blurred, right? You perceive the whole thing sharp, but if you like pay attention, you will actually notice that you really only see like a couple of cells sharp, and, and you kind of compensate for that by eye movement. So you move your mind, your eye gaze around. Um, but and then and therefore can like perceive 
um, the whole spreadsheet and it appears sharp to you, but in fact, it's not like a picture from a camera. Um, it, it's much different, like we have high quality in the center and then less sharp vision uh, or, uh, outside of what is kind of like uh, seen in the folio. Uh, and so to kind of like still get be able to see the world as it is, um, vision works as a very rapid sequence of fixations and fixates. So fixations are like when we stop our eyes for a short period of time and really perceive what we see, and then saccades are when we move our eyes between those different spots. So um, fixations take about 200 to 600 milliseconds, and saccades moving between different locations is somewhere on the order of 200 to 100 milliseconds. Uh, and so here on the right, you see, again, ads uh, for um, per perfume, probably, uh, where somebody has done an eye-tracking study. Um, on top of that, with three different subjects, the green, red, and blue, green, red, and blue. And they have marked. Um, every time there was a fixation on this uh, on this um, image, it marked it with like a circle, and then the saccades are shown as these lines connecting those circles. And you can see basically how people perceive an image like this by following um, these, these paths. And so you can see that people uh, look into the eyes of a person um, very um, frequently. And so um, this here is a picture that really um, like illustrates what I said before. Like this, um, our our vision isn't like a camera takes a sharp picture for the whole image, but we really only take, like mentally take these like very sharp pictures in the center and everything else is blurred because we can reconstruct it. So it's an ongoing construction project. Um, here is an, a video of like aggregated how where people look in an, in an, in an ad um, with an eye tracker. So this is like. Uh, you can use this for marketing purposes, right, to see whether the things that you care about are really highlighted, but you can, of course, also use that for research. Uh, this is how such an eye tracking experiment would like, look like. Um, so you have like a computer monitor that presents a stimulus, and then you have so, like an infrared camera that shines infrared light into your eyes, um, and the camera tracks the position of your pupils. This, uh, this whole thing is registered. Um, to the frame of reference from the screen, and so by simply looking at where your pupils point relative to this uh, to the screen, you can track exactly where people look. And if you run like a high quality experiment, uh, as you would do in like psychology perception sciences, you would put somebody in this like uncomfortable head and chin rest, uh, so that you make sure that their their head doesn't move. Um, here is an example of like a more modern device, as you would use them in uh, like marketing research or in like the kind of research I do occasionally uh, where people can actually move their head around a little bit and that is compensated by head tracking. And there are also mobile devices. So if you like want to start study how people go through a supermarket and what kind of brands they see, uh, you can use a mobile device like this. Or if you want to like study how people interact with physical objects or like a handheld device, you can use a mobile device like this. Uh, and so here is a video um, for somebody singing karaoke with one of those machines. <laughs> yeah. So what you see here is how we read, right? Uh, we read like basically a word at, at, at a time. Uh, we can move our eyes between those different words. Um, as I already mentioned, our vision system isn't a general purpose vision system. Uh, what we see really depends on our goals and expectations. We are good with relative judgments, and that's a very important thing for us in visualization. But we are have like we're pretty bad in absolute judgment, and so you can then create pictures like this um, in a setup that's called the Ames Room, um, where we have like a, like a, a dwarf, a normal sized person, and a giant. But it could be like these people are probably roughly the same size. And like, what's going on here? Yes, you have this kind of setup here. Uh, where you have a distorted room, and we perceive a room like, of course, we have other clues like shadows and so on that can help us to kind of figure out these, these problems. But if, um, like, if you take a picture here 
uh, from this perf perfect point of view, um, this room is designed so that it appears rectangular. And so here's a, a little video that demonstrates this. So this is an Ames room, and then you see the person walking in and actually shrinking as he moves back. There's no computer graphics involved here. And then when we change the perspective by taking away the camera, we can see what's going on. So it's this distorted room with non-rectangular uh, floor tiles um, that you simply, from this one particular vantage point, look just like that. Okay, so um, let's talk about color. Um, color is a, like a, a gigantic subject. Um, it's very important in visualization. Um, we'll be covering a fair bit about it, but it, it's like if you really go into color science, you can fill a whole lecture. So this is more of like a, a practical introduction to color. Um, color is the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so light waves um, and at the length of 390 to 750 nanometers. Um, and you've probably heard of spectral colors. Spectral color, colors are those that are evoked by a single wavelength. They are also called monochromatic or rainbow colors. Um, so for example, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And this is what you like um, get if you see a rainbow or if you like use a prism to kind of like uh, break the light into its uh, constitu uh, constituting components. Uh, and all other colors, like these are like a, a pure red, a pure, pure orange, a pure yellow, these are fully saturated colors. And other colors, especially white, are a mixture of these different wavelengths. Um, so purple, magenta, or any grayscale uh, uh, light is a mixture of, um, uh, of the pure spectral colors. Um, color isn't the same thing as wavelength, right? We have the, like the, the, the term we use for uh, for wavelengths that corresponds uh, to color is hue. Um, so color is rather a combination of wavelengths and energy. So for example, if we have um, two waves where you have like a signal strength that is fairly low here, that would correspond to a, a brown color. Also mixing in some other colors here. Whereas we, if we have a wave like a wavelength distribution of a light source is like this, we would perceive it as yellow. Um, color vision is actually, it turns out, irrelevant to much of normal vision. So you can like live a perfect life or like, a reasonably fulfilled life uh, without ever being able to see color. Um, you can like uh, recognize objects, uh, you can drive, like traffic lights are designed such that you can still see uh, what's going on. Um, and so it's, it's not completely clear why we actually need color vision, but there are some evolutionary reasons. Um, uh, it doesn't help us to perceive layout of objects. We don't even understand how they're moving. Uh, what shape they are is also not important. But what they do is they help us um, break camouflage. And so that's a hypothesis why uh, why color has kind of like um, the color perception has evolved. And it tells us about material properties. Um, so we can judge like whether an apple. It has gone bad by simply judging its color, which is like much more difficult to um, to um, judge from just its shape. Um, so I already mentioned hue and saturation, but these are the three components that you should, that you should think of if we talk about color. We have hue, which is the wavelength of the light. Um, saturation then is the purity of the color. Um, and so what what does it mean when you think about pigments? Like paint, um, that means I have like the colored pigments and I'm not mixing them with any white or black. When you think of light, um, a completely saturated color uh, would have like the, uh, the, the ratio of the dominant wavelength to the others is what you should think about in light. And so if you have the dominant wavelength, like a single wavelength and nothing else, then you have a completely saturated color. But if you have other colors mixed in, uh, then you have, uh, then you have a, a non-saturated color. Um, and so 
it helps. The value of the finding is that um, you also sometimes are referred to as luminance and brightness. It's the lightness or the darkness of the color, so the overall intensity of the light, how much of the wave there are. And so it helps to think about this in this HSV model, right? So you have here circular are the different wavelengths, and then saturation is like how unique is the color. So if I'm here, I have just red. If I'm here, I'm mixing some orange and some violet and some yellow in here. If I'm here, I have a perfect mixture of all of the hues. Um, and then from here to here is the value, which is the intensity. And so if we don't have any waves, then we essentially have no light, and then it's black. Um, and the, satura well, the saturation, I already talked about this. And so this is kind of like a model for you to think about these different components, uh, hue, saturation, and value. Um, how do, why do we perceive objects as colored? Yeah, it's because of their reflective properties. Um, so for example, real light, like this, these, um, well, these uh, artificial light uh, sources emit some kind of like mix uh, white color, so it like, actually mixes like very various wavelengths. Um, but then if we have an object like the chairs you're sitting on, we perceive them as red, that's because um, the material properties only reflect light of that certain wavelength. And so like, we have all of these different colors coming in, uh, mixed together, but reflection only happens uh, for one particular wavelength based on the material properties of the object. Um, there's this like, really amazing radio lab episode it talks a little bit more about um, which kind of animals have which kind of color vision. There's two, actually, of them. Um, it turns out the mantis shrimp has the most color receptors, but it's a little bit debatable uh, whether they are, uh, whether they can actually like make use of, of all of that information. Um, so like definitely a recommendation. Uh, I'll put up the, the slides, and then you have this. So quiz, what are the primary colors? Red, green, blue, red, yellow, blue, orange, green, violet, cyan, magenta, yellow. Who thinks it's one? Who thinks it's two? Who thinks it's three? No way. Four. It's a trick question. So it's a trick question. Um, it can be anything, right? Um, <laughs> so it depends on, on like what we are talking about. Uh, if we talk about paint mixing, our primary colors, like paint mixing, is we we kind of like it's about the reflective properties of the objects or of the of the material of the paint. Um, and so here, the typical primaries we use are red, yellow, and blue, and the secondary mixed colors are green, orange, and purple. Um, and so this is like a subtractive color model. Um, if we mix ink, where we subtractively mix. Transparent inks, then we use cyan, magenta, and yellow. This is like what your color printer, your ink uh, color printer uses. Um, and because these are transparent, it's fairly hard to actually create pr uh, proper black. And so uh, many printers have CMYK, where K is the um, black component. Again, this is a subtractive um, color model. And then if we mix light, we actually combine different wavelengths of light. And so here, the typical uh, primaries we use are red, green, and blue. This is what, what we have in our computer displays mostly. Um, and then we have secondary mixed colors of cyan, magenta, and yellow. And so this is an additive color model. Uh, this is a way, like these um, chromaticity diagrams are a way of thinking about the color spectrum. So what you have here is the, in this diagram, you have the wavelengths distributed on the outside of this diagram. So these are the pure saturated colors in here. And then in the, anything that's not on the outer edge of this triangle here are unsaturated colors that are mixed together out of different wavelengths. Um, and then what happens in if we create a display or if we mix paint by three colors um, is that we actually pick spots along this gamut um, and then can by, by, by changing the proportions between those colors, we can create colors within the triangle. So here are like two different examples. Um, like this is the overall chromaticity diagram here, and then we have like a, a monitor. My monitor has a cert certain physical properties that allows me to mix those three colors, and that means that I can create all of the colors within the triangle with that particular monitor. But I couldn't create other colors outside of that um, triangle with that monitor. Um, and so like we have different um, color uh, like different kind of, of types of printings, different types of monitors. Some uh, some special uh, equipment has more than three 
uh, color so that you can kind of extend it a little bit. Uh, but typically, this is what you're working with. And so kind of like the uh, takeaway point from this is not every color that we can actually see and that exists in nature can be completely faithfully reproduced on a computer screen. Um, and this is why, like, also the primaries here are arbitrary, right? I usually choose them based on, on like, some material properties. Yeah? The X and Y? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> I wondered that myself, but I actually don't know. <laughs> What's the numbers going in? Is that the, the wavelength? Yes. Like, the, you mean the, wave, like yeah. the numbers out here? Yeah, that's a full wavelength. No, it's 2D. I'll definitely make a note, and I'll let you know what X and Y are. Um, so um, why do we care about um, color so much in visualization? Because we want to create color maps, so encode data um, and specify a mapping between colors and values. Um, and we distinguish between a, typical, a couple of different types of color maps based on, uh, on properties of the data. Categorical versus ordered, sequential versus diverging, segmented versus continuous, univariate versus bivariate. Um, so here are a couple of examples. <coughs> this is a, um, a sequential color map. Um, so we start at one color and then move into the other, and we can map uh, like a numerical vector to it. Here we have a, a multi-hue categorical color map uh, where we essentially like don't want to express orders. Uh, this would be well. There's another example of a sequential. It's the same one. This is a diverging color map where I have a neutral point and then values above the neutral point and values below the neutral point. Um, I can make like the examples I've shown so far were bins. I can make them, of course, continuous, um, and I can create these kind of like uh, um, swatches that I can use as a legend. So what we need to do, like when we want to encode data with color, we need to match the color map to some kind of attribute characteristic. Um, like a tool that you can use when you want to create visualizations that gives you color recommendation um, is Color Brewer. This is like a, an interactive website that So this is an interactive website that you can use to like, basically specify what kind of properties does your data have. Is it sequential? Is it diverging? Or is it categorical? And then you get color recommendation. It was designed for maps, but it is widely used um, in visualization. E3 has many of those swatches built in. Um, so you, And I'll talk more about this. You can kind of specify how many categories you want and so on. Um, there are certain like, other properties that you can specify, so I'll come back to this eventually. Um, the thing is that um, like we have like a lot of colors, right? In theory, we would have infinite, infinitely many colors, uh, but in practice, we can't really perceive them very well. Uh, we can tell them apart very well. So, uh, like a rule of thumb is that you shouldn't use more than six different colors um, to identify um, to identify different objects in, in a scene. Um, definitely not more than ten. Um, here is a picture that shows you. Um, the internet as it was in, in 2002 and color certain domains uh, using 22 different colors. Um, and so here alone we have like five greens which are basically indistinguishable, especially if they're not right next to each other, right? Um, so that's like a, a, a counter example of what not to do. So it's just like color is, is like I'll talk about much more about this when we talk about marks and channels, but colors is, color is tricky to use. Um, for quantitative data, uh, we, we should always use value, color value, and never use color hue. Um, saturation works also, but isn't quite as good, but don't use hue. Like one common problem that you see is the rainbow color map. Um, like if you use MATLAB, like three years ago, it still had the default jet color map, which is a rainbow color map, um, which you see here in the, in the first row. Um, and so why is the rainbow color map not such a great idea, generally speaking? Yeah. It's not a consistent ordering that people will place those colors in. Exactly. There's no ordering in a color. Is red bigger than green or than blue? We don't know. Any other ideas? 
Yeah. Exactly. So we don't perceive to hues equally. Like, like if you look here, the yellow band is actually much smaller than the green band, right? So um, it's not um, like the wavelength doesn't correspond exactly to the perception. And the other thing, and the other ideas why it's not as a great idea, um, we might uh, associate different things with different colors. So red is hot and blue is cold. Yes. Uh, that's something actually people do leverage sometimes. So if they want to point out an extreme value, they also like to be red. Uh, but it's definitely a problem. Uh, we have semantic, uh, we have semantic association with colors. Another problem is that these th thresholds here, where is the edge between red and yellow? That's actually fairly arbitrary, right? Um, so if something is yellow uh, or if something is red, really they can, they can be very close to each other in data space, but very far apart in how we perceive it. Um, so here is an example of some fluid flow uh, with a rainbow color map and a continuous color map. You see the color maps at the bottom. Um, and so what you see here is that the rainbow color map really is great at highlighting the extreme values, right? Um, so we can see here, the, like whatever it is, intensity, velocity of the fluid. Um, here the velocity is very high at these points, whereas here it's a little trickier to see what are the absolute extrema. Uh, but this here gives you a much more nuanced picture, right? You don't, like, if you look here, like, if you look here, you would say, well, this isn't very, uh, this is very different from this. But if you look at this picture here, you actually, there is, like, a continuous grade here that you kind of, like, miss um, in, if you use the rainbow color map. But if the only thing that you care about is identifying a maximum, Maybe this isn't such a terrible color map. And in our lab, like one of our PhD students has actually done research on studying why are those rainbow color maps so popular in, in scientific and engineering applications, and why do people use them? And his hypothesis was that they create an implicit binning that I can then use as a legend. And, and he has evidence that it's true, and, and there's efforts to create more uniform uh, color maps, like more perceptually uniform rainbow color maps. Uh, but generally, like it's, it's like a, a tricky subject. Uh, the same student actually has done this work on, on uh, the benefits of like using a bin color scale or a continuous color scale. So here you have a to uh, topographical map on the right, um, elevation uh, on this color scale, um, and it just washes out a little bit on this projector. Uh, but what you can see, I think, is that the first one is completely continuous, and the bottom one here is bin. Um, and so what they found is. They studied what is faster, where can I read values faster at a certain point, and which uh, of those two color maps are more accurate. Anybody want to speculate? Yeah? Maybe uh, the, the static continuous one is more accurate, and the binary one uh, is Seems like an interesting hypothesis, yes. Uh, and so their findings were that continuous was faster, which was kind of slightly surprising. And BIND was often more accurate. <laughs> uh, I can like, I refer you to the paper for, for the details, but it's, it's kind of surprising. But in the end, your finding was um, the speed difference wasn't very big. Um, and so BIND is, is often a very good solution. Um, so in practice, you maybe should use a BIND color map for data lines. Um, Another big topic, um, especially if you build tools for a wider audience, not just for yourself, um, is color blindness. Um, turns out that about 10% of all males uh, and about only 1% of females um, have some color deficiency. Um, anybody has a slightly colorblind? I'm a carrier. Both my sons are colorblind. Okay. Um, so that is probably due to an X chromosomal recessive inheritance. So if you have two X chromosomes, you're much less likely to be colorblind. Um, and the most common one here is red-green weakness, blindness. Um, and the, the reason is that we have like a lack of medium or long wavelength receptors or some altered spe uh, spectral sensitivity of the cones. Um, and most commonly, this is a green shift. Um, and so out of the 10%, like a slight red-green weakness is the most common color blindness condition. So like usually, if you design for a general audience, you really want to make sure that it's red-green color blind safe. Um, you typically can't make it completely colorblind safe if you want to use color. Um, so this is what the rainbow flag would look like for somebody with normal color perception. If you don't have any green receptors, this is what it would look like. And if you have no red receptors, this is what it would look like. And so 
Um, you might have seen this, like, what's the number here? Oh, no. <laughs> it gets more mumbly as we go along. <laughs> Those are, those are slightly hard, but this is the kind of test that you would use if you like run a perceptual experiment, for example, to see whether people have any kind of red-green or any color blindness um, um, at all. Um, and so if you have a hard time seeing some of those pictures, it might be because of your projections, but if you have printers in front of you and you can't see any of those numbers, uh, then you might have some color weakness. Um, here are some other like, na nature examples of um, uh, what color blindness um, looks like um, if you have um, different conditions, different images, red-green deficiencies versus blue-yellow deficiencies. Um, this is an example from the New York Times. We'll actually look at this in more detail. Um, like one big problem is we have green and red are some like they are very like important in our in our culture, right? They they have certain meanings. Green is go, red is problematic, down. Uh, and so this is from a visualization that shows uh, Obama's. Um, proposal, budget proposal back in, in like 2012, um, and it shows uh, for discretionary spending where are increases and decreases. And they use red and green, which kind of like seems natural to encode that, but if you're colorblind, you actually can't see it, right? Um, so you can't see that here, like we have uh, th these two are the same color um, if you have a red green blindness. Um, you can actually simulate these color vision deficiencies. So if you create a visualization, you can upload a screenshot of your visualization to this tool and to some others like it. Um, and I did that for a recent visualization that the New York Times published about uh, zoning in, uh, in various cities across the country. Um, this is the, the map they use to their defense. They have like many other maps that also show more aspects of it. Uh, but this, like when I saw this, I immediately felt like, hey, do you, you have a problem with red green here? Um, and when I ran this through there, the simulator, if you're red green blind, these are completely meaningless to you. Right? Um, and so you can actually, in this tool, you can choose the different types of color, uh, color blindness, uh, types of color blindnesses to simulate. And of course, I picked the one that really looked the worst here. Um, so all other color deficiencies can see that a little bit better. Um, if you plot in R, there's actually a package that colorblind R um, that can simulate that for you if you create figures with ggplot. Uh, so one other big thing is that, um, again, like what we perceive isn't actually what is there. That's also true for color and brightness. It always depends on the context, right? We perceive a red inside quite differently um, as, or the, the Physical properties of the red inside are quite different if I'm in, sun, in, in uh, sunlight outside, but they look the same. Um, and I'll show you a lot of examples on what I mean by this. Perceived brightness of an object is always relative to its background. Um, so I, I have a color gradient here in the background, and then I have these blocks, um, and I'm telling you now they are all of the same color. Um, and they don't look like it, right? But I can actually take these two bars here and move them over them. Um, and you can see that they are actually all of the same color. Um, here, this is called the current speed illusion. Which block is darker, the upper or the lower one? Aren't they the same? They're the same, because I call it an illusion, but which it looks darker. <laughs> the top one looks darker, right? And why do you think that is? How can we just like the background is not land? Exactly. It's where we like based on, on how we learn that light is coming from the top, uh, we kind of like expect the top here to be in better light than the bottom. Um, and if we actually put a, a gray object on top of it, then we can see that they're actually the same color. Um, there's a uh, a website where you can demo some of these effects. Here you have to do the flash thing. It's old. Uh, but yeah, here's this particular effect. Um, you can say, like, show me this, and then put this over it. Um, there are some others here uh, that where you have these, these shadow effects and these light source effects. So here you can. Yeah. So here. Like all of these, like three different uh, 
Um, shapes here, they, they seem to have different colors, but they in fact have identical colors if you take away the, the perspective cues. Um, there are many others here, so just play with them. I have a couple of more in my slides. Who knows who remembers the dress name? <laughs> uh, black and, uh, and blue or white and gold? Any, like, <laughs> uh, any preferences? Now, it turns out it really, like, um, you perceptually you can't really tell the difference. Like, we have, we, we, I think by now we know that this was some certain color. But here's an illustration of how that changes in this uh, illustrator. Somebody has clipped out and then used some, uh, like some shaded. Uh, paints here and then moves this object below them and shows you how the same, actually exactly the same uh, thing looks in these two, two different scenarios. So this is exactly the effect. They've got Twitter all crazy. Um, which of the X's is darker? Who thinks it's the right side? <laughs> Are you caught up? Uh, they are, in fact, the same. We can see at the intersection here. Uh, but we perceive them differently because we have these different background colors. Um, so here we have two colors. Do they look the same to you? Who thinks they're not the same? The brown ones is what I'm referring to. So they're not the same, right? But I can make them look the same. <laughs> Uh, so it's always super relative. Um, and, like, here is an example from um, like a, a column in Nature Methods. Um, like a lot of biologists like to use these color heat maps, um, these uh, red, blue, or red, white color heat maps. Um, and this is a practical example of this problem. Right? If you looked at this heat map here, um, you would say, "Hey, here is a data value that is a little bit higher than its surroundings. It actually has exactly the same value than this one here with the star." Um, we just perceive this one as lower uh, because it's surrounded by even darker ones. So this is, these are not just theoretical problems. We do have these problems all the time uh, when we create these kinds of programs. Okay, so now I want to do um, a design critique. Um, so this is like... Um, Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned in my introductory lecture, we'll be lot, doing lots of these. Um, here today, I want you to critique this, take a little visualization. While, they, while they're handing it out, I'll kind of just like briefly introduce it to you. This is a chart of the uh, causes of untimely death. Um, you have, like, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I just want to say what like, Bill Gates called it his graph of the year back in 2013, I think. And he said, I love this graph because it shows that while the number of people dying from communicable diseases is still far too high, but the number continues to come down. But there is not much to do to cut down the death and that yellow block even more dramatically. We have the solutions, but we need to keep up the support here where they're being deployed. And so I would like you guys to kind of form groups and then first analyze this, um, analyze this, uh, this visualization. Um, and then come up with a redesign. So detailed instructions are on your sheet. Uh, please feel free to talk, to discuss with your peers, and then we'll do this whole thing in, in, in the group, uh, in a classroom wide in the group. Okay, I'll give you guys um, five minutes for the critique, and then we'll talk, take another like three or five minutes for a redesign. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. No, but like, when I use the 
So let's, let's go through those questions and I'd like to have the classroom um, kind of answer them. So what are the questions this visualization answers? Which are the biggest diseases? Which are the biggest diseases? It answers the change of these over the past time. See what has changed the most in a positive and negative direction. Exactly. And so uh, it, it also shows, it shows us like the size of the disease, like meaning how many people does it affect. Um, and it shows us how this has changed. Okay? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just, this isn't one that I was answering, but I just had a question about the annual percent change. Is that measuring like the percentage of occasions of this, the percentage of instances of this thing, or is it the percentage relative to everything else that's changing? Um, it's not. For this particular instance, I would infer, right? I have this chart like you, but I would say that, like, if you had, let's say, a hundred thousand life years lost for a certain type of cancer, it measures like the change. If I have like ninety-five thousand life years lost for cancer, that would be what this measures. Are all of those buckets mutually exclusive? Like, can you die of both heart attack and stroke at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's never as clean as possible uh, as you as you think, right? But. Um, I'm pretty sure that the way like governments report death are like not on this individual case level, but just give summary statistics. And I think that most cases are usually assigned a single case. So, but yes, good question. Um, so let, let's recap on the data we had. So we had uh, the size of the diseases. Of course, what what else? What other data type do we have here? Like the change we had that, and what was a third one? Magnitude. The magnitude? What do you mean? Like which relative magnitude? Like diarrhea is twice as big as. Yes. Um, so size, magnitude. I, like I'm kind of conflated. Do you like mean them differently? Or if I talk about size and magnitude? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, and then there's one other thing that's usually coded here. Uh, the second disease is not more prominent interval. Uh, more prominent interval. 
in the world. Like, ah, uh, yes. Non communicable diseases uh, have like half of the exposure. Yeah, so like, I think what you're getting at here is we also have types of diseases, right? So we have like a higher level classification into non communicable diseases, communicable diseases, and injuries. Um, and like, what is kind of like from a public health perspective, what do you think we have the best ways to really make changes? Pick the biggest one. Well, the biggest one, but also which type? Oh, okay. Yeah. One. I think it's probably much easier to make a dent here in uh, infectious diseases and injuries uh, than it is in, let's say, cancer, right? Like, we spend a ton of money on research for cancer, but like there is change, but it's not the same as we have, for example, in car fatalities have decreased massively because cars have become better and policies have become better and so on. Okay, so we have these data types. Um, uh, categorization, there's like one additional categorization here that summarizes all of the different types of cancer in blue. Um, okay, how is this encoded? How is the magnitude encoded? Size of the block. Size of the block, yes. Um, and how is the change encoded? Darkness of the Yeah. Anybody have any comments about the color map? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's better. Yeah, so like, what you're getting at here is actually quite an interesting observation. Right? We talked earlier about diverging color maps. Um, here we don't have a diverging color map. Neutral, no change is actually fairly dark, right? which is kind of surprising. If we have, would you think that, let's say, neonatal infections have re remained roughly the same if you look at this chart and don't read the color map? So that's not particularly intuitive. Why do you think they chose this color map then? Yes. Yes. Other ideas? I think that's definitely a reason. I think they're trying to convey the message that, that you know the decrease here is the normal. They want the other one that maybe isn't going near anywhere to be going down. Yeah. So it could be like a conscious decision, mm -hmm. right, to say like this is what the normal baseline should be. Then it would be a reasonable encoding. Um, yeah. You know that which degree is uh, to what it is it should work first. Yeah. Like a ranking of them. Yeah, so I, I think this is part like really a, like it was a big part of why they don't have a virgin color scale is because they have this categorization, right? Um, and this categorization would be much more fuzzy if it had two different colors per, for each category. So it was probably a, a design decision. Um, anything else that's um, particular about this design here? There's a lot of Blocks that aren't labeled. Yes. So Why do you think? Too small. <laughs> Too small. So that's a usual problem with these kinds of visualization techniques. And so you can kind of like make an argument that uh, the small ones aren't important. <laughs> but yeah. Um, from my perspective, it's, it's harder to get a comparison between two different blocks when they're this. Well, first of all, the one we're at this weird perspective. But second, um, when we're in this blocky shape as opposed to The blocky shape, uh, so basically you're saying these um, blocks of different proportions are hard to compare to each other. Yes. And you said something else, uh, the weird perspective, anybody have a comment on that? Yeah, they've chosen to like, first of all, tilt the graph and also like add a third dimension. And I don't think the third dimension is adding any useful information yeah. to the graph. So. Uh, this chart would just be as readable in 2D or maybe better, right? Yeah. Why do you why did they pick the third dimension? It's it's prettier and it looks like more high tech because it's, <laughs> it's, it's more shareable. Yeah, so aesthetics are probably a reason. Could it be because they plan to like put this in a 3D printer and then to pull up the blocks <laughs> and say Well 3D printing isn't the efficient way of disseminating data. <laughs> Yeah, this chart, it's assuming that you have a concept of volume. Uh, like if, if you just viewed it as a two dimensional image, as a flat image without any prior concept of volume, then the proportion of war casualties, for example, the area, 
from an area perspective of war casualties would be more on the line of something that the edge isn't exposed to, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. I think that you, you tr you're right in general. I don't know whether this will actually apply to this chart because I'm guessing that people are not judging the air, the volume here, but the surface area. But that would be like that's a hypothesis, but it's definitely an interesting thought. I think really you had a comment. I was just going to say it's it's hard in the linear dimension between natural disasters, for example, and fire. Like which one has more surface area? Yeah, so it could be pretty much the same, but it's yeah. Like, so it seems like natural disasters you're getting at like a inherent weakness of this chart, right? We have these like. We already had this argument before. We had these like irregular shapes, or oh, not completely irregular, but like not equally proportional shapes that encode something by their area, and that is maybe not the most efficient way to encode it. Uh, but so, like this is in the Washington Post, right? And they they have this as they they really wanted to grab people's attention. Um, so um, I'll take one more comment. Uh, and the encoding is also kind of confusing as well. Like heart disease is. is the little note at the bottom, and it actually makes up a quarter of all deaths. And yet, its size on the whole graph makes up maybe five percent, which seems a little bit misleading in terms of what sort of magnitude. Well, uh, that is probably because um, there's two different things going on here, right? There's life years lost and cause of death. And people that are 85 frequently die of heart disease. Um, so this is not absolute numbers, right? So this is like actually an important point. We're, we're showing like life years lost. Um, so the quarter of all cases of all like um, uh, a quarter of all deaths are caused by heart disease, and still it's this tiny block, and that's that's because of uh, like heart disease usually doesn't affect young people that have a, a, a longer life expectancy. Um, so now uh, I want to kind of like move on to what are your redesigns like? Can anybody describe what they did? So can we just pop this in a pivot table and then do like a stack bar chart and then let the user slice and dice to their <laughs> Heart's content. Yes, so uh, basically you're saying a bar chart is, is your redesign or stack bar, chart. stack bar chart. Okay, anybody else have any, anything? I thought of a horizontal bar chart where the bar can go positive or negative. Uh -huh. So it'd be really easy to see if it's growing or shrinking and then sort it in order of size. Oh, cool. Have you seen my redesign? Yeah. <laughs> That's very close to what I'll show you later. Yeah, uh, I was kind of thinking to make these those uh, third entry. So what if they could be like mountain peaks for each block, so that we could visualize which height that. Uh, what is the intensity of the change in each city? Okay, yeah, I that might be more fancy uh, than than this chart here. Uh, there's a couple of problems with that, and we'll talk about them. Uh, just yeah, I, I don't want to um, spend the time on this now, but I'll show you guys um, a redesign. Uh, of like a professional uh, designer um, that has looked at this chart, uh, Stephen Few that runs the Perceptual Edge blog. Um, and this is really like meant not for this PowerPoint slide, but for somebody who has it on the computer screen, right? So it's, it's a little hard to read. Uh, but what has he done? Uh, Stephen Few is known, like he has a reputation for being this very like business intelligence. I want to make decisions. I don't want to attract people's attention because I expect them to pay attention to my work anyways. Um, <laughs> So uh, what he did here is he created kind of like this chart, as you mentioned, with the uh, change of years lost in 2005 and 2010. That is kind of our middle chart here. Um, so he essentially took this and made three bar charts out of it. So he has years of life lost per 100,000 um, in 2010. Um, this is the top one. And here you see quickly cancer, heart disease, and then other neonatal and uh, T-mal disorders. Um, he did color code them in less like uh, less less interesting colors or more muted colors, um, and then he added two other uh, charts. He added the changes in years of life lost, 2005 and 2010, and that's kind of like an interesting visualization, now, right? Because here you can see that for um, communicable diseases, this row here, um, it, it causes six percent of years life lost. But it has gone down by 25 percent, right? Um, so we can very quickly see this in this chart, and we see other infectious diseases actually have a similar negative trend. Um, the one that we have um, that we have going up here, the changes in years of life loss, is the injuries and other accidents. 
Um, and uh, well, some others are going up, but these are the big ones, right? Um, and, and then he added another column, death per 100,000. This kind of gets to the point that we had earlier about this block, like saying there's a quarter of, uh, of, you know, of death or cost by heart disease, uh, but not so many uh, life years lost, right? So you see that here, these two bars, cancer and heart disease, cause most of the death, but not, well, they also cause most of the life years lost, but not with such a gap as you would expect them to be. Um, and there's like other like notes here. This is really designed for close reading. Um, and so now, like when I show this to you, if you compare this to the other chart, what do you think? Uh, this doesn't visually show the balance between the three large categories as well yeah. as the other chart does. It does mention the upper left but only has percentages. Yes, it doesn't actually visually show like the, the big blocks. Like it's it's harder to get this overall grasp uh, about like what are the big causes of uh, tension death. How do we do drill down? How do we drill down in the cancer? Uh, well, yeah, so he has chosen to sum up cancer in total. Um, so that's kind of like um, a choice. You could do a drill down if you use interactivity, right? Or you could break out cancer separately. Um, that, that's tricky in a study chart like this. Um, I'm sure, like, if he has a blog post. Um, I'm probably sure that he argued why this, is, uh, why this is important. But yeah, you cannot show as many, like, there, there's there are some other, like he had to summarize this in some way. Yeah. Um, is there a difference Yeah, so he could have picked a little bit more differentiable colors. My guess would be that the casual user wouldn't be as likely to look at this chart just based on the amount of effort it looks like it takes. Yeah. Is the other one a little more inviting to just casually look at? Yeah, so you get a very important point, right? Like, would, it, would that chart be as equally interesting for somebody who has to compete for attention on Twitter to get people to read the newspaper article? Just hire a fortunist if you want. <laughs> we'll talk about these kinds of things, right? But there is this, 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 this conflict between being as faithful as possible um, and using like the best visual encoding is possible. So for example, here the bars we have, they're much easier to, to break apart than, uh, than the, the shapes we had before. Uh, so we can see subtle differences. Um, but that's, um, like, this might be something that you would find in a United Nations report, right? Uh, but not necessarily, just, well, you might find this in the, in the New York Times, but the other one is, of course, much more flashy. OK, we've run a little over. Um, next time, we'll continue with perception. Um, and then we will move into, well, next time is actually SVG, so Thursday after that, we'll continue with perception. Um, and then do some data.